bodies are heavy, you know. I first heard it when I saw Papa talking to Miss Carmichael next door. She was laughing at something he'd said. I wasn't close enough to hear the words, just the frequencies of his warm rumble and her excited laugh. The light waves bringing me the flush of his ears and the gleam in her eye. It used to make Mama laugh like that before she got sick and died. Just then, another voice whispered in my head, velvetly soft. That's not right. Not right at all. I felt no fear. Only excitement, curiosity. Who are you? A singularity. A black hole floating alone in the inky dark of space. And if you'll allow it, your friend. Looking back down at them, I pressed my fingers against the cold window pane and gave a nod. How are you talking to me? This was the next day. The first day I'd been so shocked by this visitor in my head that I'd actually treated it more normally, like the way you might act in a bizarre dream, but when my new friend was still there the next morning, I started asking questions to test whether this was real or some sign of madness. My friend seemed unperturbed. Time and space don't mean much to me. This may sound strange to you, but there's little difference between an inch and a million, million miles. In most ways, I'm as close to you as to everything else. Okay, but how did you find me? I heard you crying, and I knew you were as lonely as I am. Britt, have you seen Mrs. Carmichael the past couple of days? I look up at him, my face smiling, even though my heart was not. No, Papa. I wrinkled my nose the way he liked. Why? He puffed out a shaky breath. Well, no one can find her. I went over to, uh, I went over to ask her something and she wasn't there and no one's heard from her. I bet he went over. See how upset he is. Unseemly. Using my inside voice, I agreed. But what can we do? Show him. But grab your cutter first. Widening my eyes, I giggled. <laughs> Just remembered, I think I know where she is. I held out my hand to him. Let me show you, Papa. Some people think I'm nothing, but that's not true. I'm everything, but I'm always hungry for more. I tried to talk with my mouth full. I'm sorrow. It doesn't matter. Only gravity does. It drags them down to us so we can eat. I squinted as the door to the forgotten house opened. The man there screamed as I bent down to take another bite of my father's cool face. Should I be ashamed? No. We open our mouth and gravity feeds us. And bodies are heavy, you know. Should I be afraid? Never. We are everything. Everywhere. We are God. And how could God ever be lonely? There's a rule in my hometown that you should never acknowledge an unwanted passenger in your car. I come from a quaint little town in Ireland that most tourists would regard as picturesque. We get our fair share of tourists throughout the year as they love to wander the walking trails that crisscross the outskirts. From the outside, our town would be regarded as perfect, but we hide a dark secret that only the inhabitants know about. I learned about the secret during my first driving lesson with my mother. I was beyond stressed that morning as my mother is a perfectionist and I didn't want to disappoint her. We started off slowly as she taught me to drive down the narrow roadways. My hands had a vice-like grip on the steering wheel and I was paranoid that I was going to make a mistake. 
I kept glancing at my mother out of the corner of my eye to judge her reaction to my driving. We were driving almost a half hour when I looked into the rearview mirror and spotted the smiling man sitting in the back seat. I was so shocked that he almost spun the steering wheel and crashed into the ditch. My mother screamed at me to keep driving and whatever I do, don't turn around. My eyes were fixated on the mirror as I stared at the man who had suddenly appeared in our back seat. His face was somehow clouded in shadow, even though it was a beautiful sunny day outside. The only features of his face that I could make out were his eyes, which were a sickly green. His mouth was twisted into a snarling smile that made me want to jump out of the car. I watched in horror as he started reaching forward with his long spindly arms toward me. I was paying so much attention to him that I'd taken my feet off the gas pedal and we were slowing down. My mother slapped me across the face and yelled at me to drive faster. I sped up and watched in relief as his arms slowly withdrew back towards his body. He leaned his head forward and opened his mouth and a plethora of voices began pleading for help. I instinctively covered my ears with my hands which forced my mother to grab the steering wheel. It took me a few seconds to regain my composure and I grabbed the steering wheel. My entire body was on edge as the cries coming from his mouth reached a deafening crescendo. In the blink of an eye, a smiling man vanished, leaving me and my mother alone in the car. I pulled the car off to the side and proceeded to vomit out my breakfast. The local police officer drove by and stopped to see what was wrong gave me a nod of approval as my mother explained that we had an extra guest in our back seat. We drove home in silence, and I tried to venture the subject with her on a number of occasions, but she refused to talk about it. I learned from a few other people that he's been appearing in cars for almost 70 years. No one knows anything about him, but they all warned me to never turn to face him. I moved away to college a few months afterward and over time forgot about the smiling man. I started dating a guy named Mike that I met in my history class. We are both a bit shy so no one knew that we were actually a couple. It started getting serious with Mike so I decided to bring him home to meet my mother. I was a bit nervous how she would react to him. We were just driving into town when I spotted the smiling man once again sitting in my back seat. The blood drained from my face as we locked eyes in the mirror. Mike suddenly jumped in his seat as he must have noticed the smiling man. I shouted at him not to turn around, but it was too late. The smiling man's grin widened as Mike turned in his chair to look at him. There was a blinding flash that caused me to jam on the brakes. I was suddenly drenched in blood and body parts as Mike's body exploded. I climbed out of the car and onto the road weeping as Mike's body flowed out of the car and pooled onto the ground. I was discovered by the same officer who tried his best to comfort me. It took me almost two weeks to get myself cleaned up as I kept finding pieces of Mike in my hair. I went back to college almost three months later and felt my heart drop as I spotted posters hanging everywhere with Mike's face plastered all over them. A woman saw me looking at them and asked me for help locating her missing son. I excused myself, practically ran away. I didn't have the heart to tell her that her son was buried in a small field in the middle of nowhere. Now living with an abusive husband managed to convince him to travel to my hometown with me, and I hope that I'll get an opportunity to introduce him to the smiling man during our visit. Cell Starter He was sitting alone in seat H of row 47. Minutes earlier, the seats around him had been full of cheering fans, but now they'd all been herded into one of five separate holding areas while we determined any potential threats. If the tip was right, this guy had somehow smuggled in enough explosive to take out everything in a 50-yard radius of where he was sitting. 
Uh, hey, Timothy. That's your name, right? He grinned at me. Yep, that's me. That's my name. I edged into the row in front of him. I was wearing a flak vest, but it wouldn't save me if he had something serious. If it was even on him at all. But, no. I had to focus. Get him to focus. Get enough info or get close enough to make sure he didn't have a dead man switch. Tim, you've got a lot of people really scared right now. He raised his eyebrows. Uh, is that so? Yeah. We got a tip an hour ago with your name and picture. Said you brought a bomb in here today. Planned to kill a lot of people. He just looked at me placidly like I was telling him we were out of his favorite soda. Now, I'm hoping this is all false alarm, but we have to check. So, Tim, did you bring an explosive device in here? Browning, he shook his head. <laughs> no, of course not. My stomach unclenched a little. Okay, that's good, that's great. Not that I don't believe you, but do you mind standing up and taking off your shirt? He did so without complaint, turning in a small circle before I could even ask. When he was done, he pulled down his shorts and underwear and did another turn before sitting back down. See? No bombs. I stared at him. Why are you so casual about this, then? He wasn't looking at me now, but staring up at the sun. He teaches that fire is everything. From the stars that light the universe to the electricity driving our brains, fire is... life. He looked back to me and he was weeping. The gift to control and harness our fire is such a blessing. He smiled wetly. He taught us that too. What are you? I'm casual. Because my job is just to distract you while my brothers and sisters were carried with the flameless that packed this place. Three in each of the five sectors of your bomb evacuation plan. I stumbled as the first one of the explosions sent shock waves through the concrete and steel around us. More than enough to cleanse this place. I went to draw my gun, but his skin was already peeling away and licking tongues of red and orange. The heat of it stole my breath, even as the first shockwave began tearing me apart with the hands of flame. The world became heat and light and thunder, and even as a ghost of ashes, still, I burned. 